Good afternoon, everyone. I am Teresa Campbell, the 2022 MT Sherm Diversity and Inclusion Director. I am so glad that you have taken time out of your day to join us for this very informative webinar that we have planned for you. So what to expect during the meeting? The chat feature is available if you have any questions. We ask that you to place your questions there. We will leave time at the end of the presentation to address them. However, in the event that we don't get to all of your questions, we will provide them to the presenter and uh, get those responses back out to you. At the end of the presentation, there will be a short survey. We will ask that you please take some time and complete the survey for us. We definitely value your feedback and that's how we do make changes and updates to these webinars and presentations. Also, we would like to offer some feedback to the presenter. Lastly, and when you registered, you should have seen that this webinar has been approved for a CE credit. We will get that information to you shortly after the presentation within the next few days, no later than a week. So now let's get to our bio for our speaker. Ida Bird Hill is the CEO of Automation Works, a cybersecurity reskilling and diversity consulting firm that has been recognized as one of the nation's top cybersecurity boot camps by Career Karma and one of the best cybersecurity boot camps of 2021 by Intelligent.com. Ida has this prior business experience, including five years in human resources, executive search, where she created the diversity culture audit, 14 years in finances, creating the financial fitness course, Fluke. 14 years piloting public private partnerships, including the creation of a cyber alternative high school. Ida Bird Hill is a graduate of United, University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, with a BA in economics and Jack Welch Management Institute of Strayer University with an MBA specializing in people management strategy. She is the author of eight books, including Invisible Talent Market, a Black Labor Economics History Book. Ida has appeared in the Associated Press, Daytime NBC, Detroit News, Detroit Free Press, Essence Magazine, Good Morning America, and so many more media outlets. However, I'm going to stop there so that we can now hear from this phenomenal presenter, Ida. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be in, in, in the middle Tennessee. I actually have a Tennessee connection because my uncle lives in Tennessee. So he's right there in Memphis. So I'm pretty excited to be with you. Let me share my screen and get straight to our presentation. Hiring BIPOC employees during the Great Resignation. The Great Resignation, we've heard it all, but I see it as what we call really a great upgrade. And let's look at this video so you can see my rationale for why. The COVID-19 pandemic created a workforce cast of higher paid and lower paid workers. Higher paid workers perform their jobs, promoted home, while lower paid workers slugged to a physical location or were laid off. Most of the lower paid workers were diverse, African, Hispanic, Native Americans, and women. In the past, these lower paid workers were fearful of learning new tech until they shepherded their children through virtual schooling, gaining basic digital skills. Lower paid workers are quitting in person jobs as they are not utilizing or getting compensated for their newfound digital skills. The so-called great resignation is really the great upgrade. These diverse workers are now ready to learn business tech, IoT support, cybersecurity, software development, and data analytics. America has the grand opportunity to reduce the proverbial talent shortage by providing culturally relevant reskilling for lower paid diverse workers. Now people ask me the question, 
Why did I change the title to The Great Upgrade? I believe how you frame something determines how you attack it. And one of the wonderful things that we in HR have is that our employees drive corporate revenue and profit. Yes, I said our employees, because we hired the bulk of the employees for the corporation, which means we have responsibility for what they do in our business. And we forget that we literally have the largest asset underneath our belts, which puts us in a prime place to be the business strategist for our corporation. So the great resignation sounds pretty sad, but the great upgrade gives us an opportunity for us to move our companies forward if we change the metrics of how we look at ourselves. Having been in HR, I know most of us look at how fast we're filling our positions, our time to hire, our time to fill. But I'm gonna make the suggestion that for 2022, that the metrics should be revenue per person. Why? Oftentimes, HR professionals, no matter how far we rise up a corporation, we are never promoted into the CEO spot. And oftentimes we're told the reason we're not in that spot because we don't manage a, a profit and loss statement that deals with the intake of revenue. But we are responsible for all of the employees, which means we are responsible for all of the revenues in our corporations. And I suggest that if we looked at ourselves and our employees and the revenue that we're making per person, we can catapult ourselves into leading the business strategy, the revenue generation strategy of most of our businesses. And it doesn't matter what size you are, whether you are a large business and you have 20 people in your department, or whether you're a small business and you have one or two people in your department, you have the greatest asset, which means you have a good say in understanding of where the business strategy could go based on your employees. And I'll give you a good example. I actually was in a small department at a large engineering consulting firm because our HR department was small because many of our tasks were spread across multiple departments. Payroll was in accounting, EELC compliance was in marketing, we had safety that was in the operations department. But one of the things that we realized, because we do understand our employees, we were able to be able to move all of those tasks into a department and make it bigger as we were to, able to tell our partners things that made our clients happy and which made our employees happy. And many of us are in that position, but do we utilize our business strategy act to move the company forward? Are we looking at the revenue or are we just looking at the tasks that we complete? And I said, this year in 2022, let's look at the, the revenue and how we can drive our companies forward. The first one is diversity markets. Whenever we talk about diversity markets, we refer to those entities as a minority. Minorities means less than, smaller than the larger portion, but what we don't know is that the diversity markets are much bigger than we think. Let's look at this video to see how big they are. Diversity markets comprise 52.9% of the total U.S. market. U.S. total market, $17 trillion annually. Diversity markets, $9 trillion annually. Diversity markets includes women, people of color, Asian, Black, Native American, Alaskan Eskimo, Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, Hispanic, LGBTQ, veterans, disabled. You can seize diversity markets by hiring diverse employees who serve as ambassadors. Ambassadors can explain the inner workings of a market and they lead how to interact with the market. These ambassadors can show how to service the market. So you should seize diversity markets by hiring diverse employees as ambassadors. Now, that's the total diversity market. But our presentation today relates to BIPOC, Black, Indigenous People of Color. That market by itself is a $4.73 trillion market, which is huge. 
the Asian market, which is spending about 1.3 trillion today, the Black or African American, which is spending 1.5 trillion, the Hispanic or Latino, which is 1.7 trillion, the Native American, which is spending 115 billion, and I added the Arab American, even though they technically, based on the US census, consider them as part of the white mainstream, I separated them just so that we can see what their market was, and it's 115 billion. The Pacific Islander market I included with Asian because most of their numbers are normally included there. But notice those five entities generate $4.73 trillion of revenue every year. The question is, does your business receive that revenue? Are you in those markets? And if you are, how well are you doing? Usually access to those markets requires someone who's an ambassador who can access those markets, who understand the differences in those markets, because all Asians are not created equal, there are difference. Uh, African American and Blacks, there are differences, because you all Hispanics are not the same, there are differences. So there are individuals who know the differences and know how to speak to those clientele, whether they're trying to seize their money or whether they're trying to attract them to become employees. And the question is, do you have ambassadors to access that $4.73 trillion of revenue? And it makes a difference. I'll give you a good example. Last year, I had an opportunity to work with a $200 million soap company. And what we realized is that they are not accessing the Asian, African-American, Hispanic, or Native American market strongly because they really needed people in those markets. So we went forth first to find a talent acquisition manager who knew enough about some of those markets on where to find those employees. And she found a few of them. Then she turned around and found some salespeople and now they are growing. So they were at 200 million. Now they're at 350 million with 125 million of those dollars specifically in the BIPOC community. So the question is, are you in those communities generating revenue and do you have the ambassadors to access those dollars? You go, why is that so important? We're doing fine as we are. Well, lots of research shows that diversity markets lead to economic growth. And for companies who want fast economic growth, they tend to do very well in diversity markets because 19% increase in revenue as said by Boston Consulting Group, 21 more percent more profits for women on your executive team as said by McKinsey and Company. But then you look at more ethnic and culture on the diversity on the executive team and the profits increase by 33% more followed by sales revenue at 15 times, the higher the racial diversity is on your executive team. Those are impressive numbers. Now, oftentimes we, most people overlook those numbers, but today's investors, they are not. They are totally clued in to the value that environmental, social and governance compliance brings. And ironically, they tend to support causes and vote with their investments. They also will vote with their feet. So when they're not happy with the company, they either stop investing or they leave their employment. And so what we're seeing is the great resignation, or I see it's a great upgrade, is employees and investors voting with their feet. They're saying they don't like what they're getting, they don't like what they're receiving, and they're finding something different. The question, are you where they're landing? Is your company attracting those finicky individuals who want to see environmental, social, and governance compliance? Are you having access in the BIPOC community as these entities want? And as you can see, the younger they are, the more expressive they are. Millennials are more expressive than baby boomers with voting with their investments. Millennials are more believed that BIPOC and diversity is more of a profitable strategy. So the, your investors and your employees are asking for it. But again, 
Don't just take my word for it. Don't even take the internet for it. This is a survey that was done by Y Pulse as it relates to Generation X and millennials. Look at where they see Black Lives Matters and racism as a social cause they are passionate about. They're both up top at number two and number three. So these are very important to your employees and particularly your younger employees. The question is, are you fulfilling the missions and social causes that they are passionate about? And they're passionate about Black Lives Matter. They're passionate about racism because they had to live through seeing the damage that's going on forth and their friends are suffering from those damages. Are you focused on the social causes that they're interested in? Now, I bring that to a case because oftentimes we think the only reason why people come to work for us is for the monetary benefit, and they do. But a lot of them come to us because they fulfill their passions for their social causes as they do their work every day. The issue is, are you in the social causes where they are? Are you involved in the causes that matter to them? And you may not think that that is a, a big issue, but in these two groups have been known to take pay cuts to go to companies that have and, and marshal their causes. So consider that in your strategy for 2022. But here's the linchpin. Oftentimes when we talk about hiring BIPOC employees, most of us tend to hire them on a lower level. And oftentimes that's stressful. And let me tell you why. Let me share this video with you. Diverse executives attract diverse applicants. Research showed four critical factors why Black employer agents are more likely to hire Black employees. Diverse applicants are attracted to companies with the least perceived amount of discrimination. Large companies with collective bargaining because it provides job protection. Diverse customers cue the companies to hire more diverse people to support them. You can improve your employer brand by hiring diverse executives leading to diverse applicants. Rather than starting at the bottom and looking for BIPOC employees at the bottom, the better strategy is to start at the top. Diverse. Executives attract applicants, but they also clear the path of potential areas of discriminatory policies so that they are retained. Because what ends up happening a lot, lower level employees, they may go to a company, and they be attracted to work at your company. But sometimes, sometimes the behavior of the staff and policies infringe upon their values and beliefs, and then they leave. But if you start at the top and where they have an executive who can attract them and they create pathways to retain, then your BIPOC community grows. And that's how you should do it. But most companies are afraid to do that because they don't think that they can attract BIPOC executives. And the question you have to ask is, how do you attract other executives? BIPOC executives are looking for grand opportunities to grow their career. They're looking for opportunities to do things they've never done before and to create new skill sets so they can move closer to the C-suite. Are you able to provide that? In a lot of companies, you are. The problem is, have you sat down and said, okay, what can we bring to the table to attract an executive, even if they're from a large company and I'm a mid-sized company? Right now, as we're going through the pandemic, one of the things that a lot of employees are looking for is flexibility. They want to have work-life balance. They don't want to work 70, 80 hours anymore. They want to spend time with their family because what they learned by being in during the pandemic that they had not spent a lot of time with their families and they are enjoying every moment of it. Does your company provide a flexible work-life balance that will be attractive to employees no matter what level they're at currently? What you will find many will take a pay cut for that flexibility in work-life balance. So instead of hiring employees at the bottom by box, let's hire them at the top. 
The second thing that is happening during this great resignation and the Wall Street Journal reported on it in November 14th newspaper that the bulk of the employees who are leaving during the great resignation are women, people of color, and what we call frontliners. And the frontliners tend to be both women and people of color. They work physically throughout the entire pandemic and expose themselves and their family to the potential coronavirus. They no longer want lower level positions. They want an opportunity to grow. BIPOC executives have the knowledge of the, the groups that they're in of how do you structure opportunities for individuals who have been frontliners? How do you get them up the chain? Because if you don't move them up the chain, they will leave. And that's what's happening with the great resignation. That oftentimes as companies, we haven't figured out how do we get individuals with basic skills to have more higher earning skills so they can move up the chain? And your BIPOC executives can give you a clue on how to do that and to best do that. Now, many of us I know have instituted lots of training programs, but very few of them are structured specifically to the population that we're serving. It's a one size fit all. And a BIPOC executive will help you be able to resize your training so that you are able to serve all of your BIPOC employees, no matter how different culturally they are within your corporation. But the question is, how do I do this? Now, normally when we go to these seminars, people give us a list of all the wonderful things that they should do. But I'm not gonna do that today because one size does not fit all. But what I am gonna say is that every corporation at this point during this great resignation, a great upgrade, should be assessing where your employer brand and culture sits. How do your own employees feel about your employer brand and culture? Because it gives you insight to what you may need to change. Survey individuals outside of your company to see how they feel about your brand. You may learn some things that you didn't know about your brand. I'll give you a good example. For the company that we served in California, what we discovered, they had a strong corporate brand. People absolutely love their product. The problem is most people don't even know where they were located because they didn't know their employer brand. So sometimes you have to work on board, not just the corporate brand, but the employer brand. What do the employees or potential employees think about you? And that's where an assessment comes into play. We created a, a, a mechanism called the Diversity Culture Audit um, that was back in the 1990s. And we did it to diversify corporate legal departments at the time. Some of our major clients were General Mills, um, Biogen, Genetics Institute, Merck. And what we discovered is that there is a subculture within your culture that oftentimes is not welcoming to BIPOC employees. And you have to figure out what is that culture. So let's look at exactly what are the steps of a diversity culture audit. Want to increase corporate profits? Then try Diversity Culture Audit. The Diversity Culture Audit documents the mindset of executives, including HR, and then coaches them to change the discriminatory policies. How it works? There are seven phases. Interview of the executives to understand their job and personal beliefs. Interview of the current and former diverse employees. Company visits to understand all the operations. Initiate executive diversity coaching services. Review of different company functionalities. Producing an audit report. Implementing recommendations. So, do you want to potentially increase the revenue of your company by removing racism? Contact us today. The diversity culture audit, as I said, has been around since 1990. But a lot of companies have not actually utilized the audit. We make suggestions, we make changes, but we never access and gather the data to find out what do our employees feel about us and what do people outside of our companies feel about us, not just the product we sell, 
but the culture and environment and experience that we provide for our employees. Because as we started this presentation, we as HR had the responsibility for our employees to drive corporate profits and revenue. Are we maximizing our profits across all markets, including the BIPOC community? If not, it is time to make an assessment to see how you can improve before you implement new strategies. Are there any questions? Ada, so far we don't have any questions. Um, but one thing I wanted to ask you, because we still have plenty of time, um, we still have at least another uh, 15 minutes or so, maybe 20, because we don't have any questions so far. Can you expand on the that last video that talks about those seven phases? Can you expand on that a little bit um, so that since we do have some time available? Yes, I will. Normally an audit is where you go through a process to do an assessment of where you actually stand. And most times when we talk about the audit, most of us flash back to the finance department because the finance department does an audit every single year. They want to know about the revenue. They want to know, did we do good or did we do bad compared to last year? Did we meet our goals? They want to know what are the hiccups that we, that we faced in generating that revenue? What things can we do better so that when we go into next year, that we're having a, a much better year than we had the prior year. The diversity culture audit is the same concept, but it mainly evolves around HR and then the departments that HR serves, but from the perspective of the human resources function. Because oftentimes there are a lot of things that happen in our department that we have no control over. We have hiring managers who make decisions and despite our best intentions, they don't listen to us. And we need to know how do we fix that scenario? And if it's common across the board, are there some things that we need to change? The diversity culture audit looks at the entire corporation, but from the HR's perspective, rather than from the finance department's perspective, because it looks at how is the interaction of the employees and are we getting to the intended goal of the employee? And that's to come to work and have an experience that they will be able to produce revenue for a corporation. But what ends up happening, very rarely do we sit and talk to the executives individually. We do, but from a perspective of what they do for a living, we very rarely ask them about their value systems. And ironically, even though we have a general culture for the corporation, each individual manager or executives bring their own personal culture to the table. And it impacts what we do as HR because they are hiring people and they're interacting with our employees daily. But how often do we know what those managers are thinking beyond the job? So what the diversity culture audit does first is to sit with those managers and executives and find out what are their value systems? Because while you may decide you want to have BIPOC employees, you may have a manager who does not. How do you handle that manager? What do you do with that man? You may want to have equity and pay, but what if you have a manager who does not believe that women should be paid the same as men? You need to be able to do an audit to see what that's like and who that is. And I'll give you a good example. Um, I was employed at Domino's Farm Services and <laughs> We had very few managers that were BIPOC in our community. And so one of the particular guys in the distribution center said he wanted to hire someone. So I found four, what I thought, perfect BIPOC potential employees, and he refused to interview them. So he, people said, oh, just let it slide. Oh, no, no, I'm not letting him slide because those, those are my numbers. I need to see some results. So I said to the, that particular manager, I understand how you feel and you don't want to do what I'm asking. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to table that position. So when you get to a point that you want to be fair and we look at all of the employees that we think are qualified, then we can come back to having a discussion about that position. But I'm going to table it for now and I'll go recruit for someone else. He really needed the people bad enough. Eventually he came back, all right, I give. 
I get it. Then we had to have a real conversation. Why are you so anti-BIPOC employees? And when he explained to me why he was um, uh, anti-BIPOC employees, it had nothing to do with the people in general. It had to do with he had a nanny that he hated. And so he judged everyone by that, that entity. So the issue is you got to get to the root of where the executive sits. Because oftentimes, while they may have bought into your corporation, they may not have always bought into all of the values. Second scenario I had is a situation where um, it was a civil engineering firm. They had not had any, any Black or Indigenous engineers. They had a few Asians. Uh, when I asked them about it, they said they can't find any qualified. I said, OK, I'm going to scour this country. And I'm going to find you a qualified civil engineer. I found one, needle in a haystack, um, lovely lady. So it was great. They didn't want to hire her. Their response was, we should have been able to get with someone from Harvard or Yale. And I had to remind them, we can't afford anybody from Harvard or Yale in any category because we don't have the budget to do so. So after fighting with them for a little bit and having some real deep down discussions on where they were coming from, and the real reason they had the criteria is because they didn't want to be embarrassed and they felt that if they had someone from Harvard or Yale and they could justify the hire. My thing is this lady is so wonderful at her craft and she's a great business developer. She will justify herself once the clients meet her. When we hired her and she met the first client, they loved her. And we were getting a minuscule amount of business from that client. But when she came on board, she expanded that, for that actual project by a few million dollars because of her interaction of knowing the particular client she was going to serve, which was a predominantly Black city. Um, so the diversity culture audit digs into why are you having difficulties? And usually it's at an executive value level. Once you look at that level, then you can look at the different how the actual departments are growing because most departments evolve around a VP or an executive and to look at some of the decisions that they're making. Are they hiring themselves? The ideal scenario for most companies to have diversity is to not hire somebody like you. Different individuals bring different ideas to the table that make it your revenue stream grow because you have your, your hands in a lot of different spaces that are beyond what you would normally do traditionally. They also bring new ideas and innovation because that new innovation creates new products and services, which now allows you to serve more people. So the diversity serves a greater revenue generation tool because it creates in innovations that are far beyond what you could think and live. And so you need to find out, is that executive open to those innovations? You may think that they are, a lot of them are not. Most people don't like change. And so oftentimes you may find someone who likes status quo and anytime you ask them to do anything outside of the status quo and particularly hire someone who that is not a reflection of themselves, that's a, that's a hard call. How do you get them over that barrier? But you have to know that the barrier exists. And so many of us think that it's just we can't find them, but it may be we're not looking because that executive just isn't interested because of whatever barriers that they have in their mind. Then the executive, the diversity culture audit now starts to dig into how do the functions interact with each other. And what we discovered, you may have one department who is pro diversity and they're high in the lane droves. But then that diverse person goes and works with another department and they're having nothing but difficulties because that other manager doesn't believe in that individual. How do you fix that? How do you, how do you deal with how that interaction amongst the community happens? And it happens a lot. And it could be something subtle is that someone's working in a factory and when they go to get the high-low, they can't find the keys because the person then hid the keys from them. Or it could be something very major that whenever I interview a Black or an Indigenous person of color, I always have something negative to say. And sometimes it could be a slight that is so ever subtle that it's not obvious. So the diversity culture audit also uproots those by dealing with the executive and how they're interacting with, with, with the individuals within your company and outside of your company. 
The last thing is with the diversity culture audit, it looks at your goal setting. Do you have goals for your revenue? Yes, we all have goals for the revenue. Every year we know exactly where we're going with our revenue. We almost exactly know where we're going to get the revenue from because we're going to market and sell in those areas. How often do we sit down and have a real discussion about going into diverse communities to generate business? A lot of large companies do, but a lot of mid-sized and small-sized companies do not. We have no, many of us have no idea where to even begin. And that's where BIPOC employees come in. So you gotta, so the diversity culture, what it does is dig to see how open is the environment in order to get black indigenous people of color. But it has to be an open process, not just in HR, but across the corporation and it allows you to identify where are your problems. I'll give you a good example. While I had a marketing manager at one particular company say, oh, she just loves, she wants diverse employees and she loves them or what have you. But as we were digging through her department, I realized she has no <laughs> black indigenous or people of color individuals in her 25 person department. So on one hand, while she's holding book clubs and having events to celebrate <laughs> black indigenous people of color, she hired none. So as I'm sitting and talking with her on a personal nature, as I'm going through the interview with her, First of all, I find out she's actually Canadian. So in Canada, they don't have a whole lot of them depending upon where you live. She lived in a small town in Canada, so she's really not accustomed to dealing with black indigenous people of color. So getting her over that hump, which is why she was having book clubs, is so that she can be able to learn about the culture that she was did not know. Instead of going to meet people, she just never hired one. So I insisted, she was looking for a social media person. You need to hire one. We can't find them. Oh, we found some. Actually, we found 20 of them. You need to interview a couple of them. Interview a couple of them. One of them was just such a superstar, she had to hire them. Um, but would that have ever happened without the diversity culture audit? No, because on the surface, she looked so pro-diversity. But as you started to dig into her department, she, it wasn't represented in her department. And I believe what people do, you see reflected in their actions, what they actually believe. And so sometimes you have to dig into, the, into, the, into your executives to really dig into their beliefs on what they actually believe because the culture of the company may say one thing, but the executive is totally doing something different. And so the diversity culture audit looks at those aspects to try to dig in and to discover where are we having a disconnect. And usually the disconnect is at, the, at a very human level, may not be at a corporate level, it's at an executive level. And so that audit looks at all of those spaces and looks at the interaction between those departments that HR serves to figure out where are we having our problem. And then you go in and you fix the problem. So we believe that every corporation should have a diversity culture audit just like they have a financial audit every year. I believe they should do that every year. They should have goals that they're setting and that they're attempting to meet those goals just like the finance department. And that they're not just generic, they are specific based on the community that you're trying to improve. And then lastly, as you set the goals, most companies tend to look at what does our community look like? What is the demographic makeup of the community where our business sits? And the diversity of your company should at least look like the demographics of where your business is. And if it's not, that tells you just right there that you probably do need to have a diversity culture audit to determine why does the demographics of my company look so different than the community in which we sit. And so if you haven't considered looking at that, you should. I believe that every company should look at that and decide more proactively that we're gonna go after a diverse market. And that in order to do that, we need to have ambassadors who understand that market and who can serve that market. And those ambassadors are your employees. And so that's what the diversity culture audit does. Now I see that there is a question and I'm gonna go ahead and deal with that question. Yes. I didn't want to interrupt you. It was, it was actually, honestly, it sounded really good to me. I've been taking notes. Oh, great, so great, great. 
So one question, we do have about three questions actually here. So one okay. question is, how do you get senior leaders to participate in the audit and how do you address pushback? Well, you're always going to have pushback. One of the reasons why we start off with the diversity market revenue, because every business wants money. We all want to generate money. And we're always struggling to figure out new ways to get revenue. One of the ways diversity markets is what I call a blue ocean strategy. You can directly compete with people, what they call red ocean, and that's a real hard, hard head up competition to get revenue. Or you can do the blue ocean strategy and go where nobody else is going. A lot of people are not going in the BIPOC community. So if you were to just to sit down with your corporation and ask the question, of particularly the marketing department, where does our revenue come from? And not just look at the dollar figures, to so look at what communities is the revenue coming from? And then as the HR department, you ask the question, how much of that is in the diversity market? Because they don't know that the diversity market is that large. Most people, because they do call it minorities, assume that it's very small. It's not, which is why you have companies like Coca-Cola who, who go after that market directly or Nike, who is all in that market because it makes them money. So the question you have to ask your corporations, because you are going to get pushback, is how much money do you want to make? And what's the goal? And then identify where you are right now in the market and then make a suggestion. Why aren't we in this market? Why aren't we in this market? The one company that I just finished a diversity culture audit, I said they were at 200 million. The first day I met them, the first four officers, I said to them, I'm so excited that you're at 200 million, but I see that you should be at a billion. And everybody in the room got quiet. And then the CEO said, why do you say that? Because the soap you sell, people absolutely unequivocally love you. They've been with you for 20, 30, 40 years. They are diehard fans. They, since you don't do any advertising, they advertise for you. That's how much they love you. Which means if they love you that way, how do you expand that across different communities and create that love in other places? But I think you should be at a billion dollars. And he goes, nobody has ever said that to us. <laughs> and he's the younger generation. He's the second generation of the business. He said, you think? I said, I think so. So what we're going to do is we're going to figure out where we're having the problem of why you're not in diverse markets and how do we expand that market because there's a lot of soap to be sold. And so what we discovered is that when you have that conversation across the board, you get a lot of people to check into the process. Now, do you have issues? Yes, you do, because a lot of companies have conservative employees. And the first thing when you say, I'm looking for BIPOC employees, the first thing they're always going to say is a pushback. I don't believe in quotas. And so I remember on this one particular assignment, I said, me either. They go, why are you here? Because we don't do quotas. We're looking at where are we going to find our next revenue stream and preferably where we're not in competition with other people. And there are very few people in your industry chasing after that BIPOC market. Most of them are large companies, but very few of them are, are organic companies. And then we went down to show them how the different segments of the BIPOC community, particularly women that they're serving, are into organic products, but you miss the market. How do you get in it? So instead of having it just as a feel good, this is why you should do it, you have to make a revenue-based case of why they need to move in this direction. Now, to me, that is not only for them, it's also for you, the HR person. Because if you can make a strong enough revenue case, you could probably leapfrog yourself into the CEO office. Because very rarely does HR land in the CEO office because we don't have revenue generation conversations. And so as an HR person who's now talking about revenue, you are now in a whole different category of having conversations with your CEO. Trust and believe they will stop in their tracks. And you say, you know, we can do this better. 
or you know, last year we did this revenue per employee, this year we're doing this. What are we planning for next year? That's a different conversation of saying we must hire BIPOC because it's the right thing to do. So just start with the revenue. Let's start with the money where all of us are sitting because this is a monetary discussion. I love that, Ida. I do. This, is, this topic is all of what you're communicating is really exciting me. <laughs> um, and I'll tell you, you did get a um, compliment. One of the things you stated, what someone believes is reflected in their actions. Mm -hmm. So what someone said that was well said, they definitely agree with you there. Um, another question is, what attracts BIPOC executives to an organization? Opportunity. They want opportunity. And each person is different. I can tell you personally, um, most, more, more often, I have always worked at startup or mid-sized companies. People go, why? Because I, I can be all over the place. When I go into a large company, I'm like a cog. I can only do one thing. And very rarely does it let me move to something else. But in start startups and mid-sized companies, I've been able to move all over the place, do all type of assignments. Anything that I saw, I had the opportunity to do. And I'll give you a good example. When I head up HR for Domino's Farm Services, which is a subsidiary of Domino's, we get, got bonuses. And that division, I could not give a bonus because we had an island that Mr. Monaghan owned that was trying to compete with another island that had a, a great hotel called Mackinac Island. And our island, Drummond, did not have a liquor license because he's Catholic and he didn't believe in liquor. So it was dragging down our balance sheet. And every time I looked at that, I cringed because I could not give employees in that division a bonus because we just weren't making money. We were losing money. So one day I said to my boss, who was the controller, we got to get rid of this island. <laughs> I can't carry this island anymore. He was like, I'll stay in your lane. I said, no, because the employees have went six months without a bonus. All the rest of the corporations on the Domino's have gotten a bonus, but our division has not gotten one because of this island. He says, well, I'm not going to Mr. Monaghan. I said, so, okay. So I sent a note to Mr. Monaghan and said, hey, I need to sit and talk to you about Drummond Island. I go over to speak to him about Drummond Island and get, go on my way to his office because I'm on the other side of the farms, long about a mile to get to his office. Everybody looking at me because they think that I'm going to get fired because this, this island is his baby, his pet peeve. He loves this pet. And so I go in and sit with him. I says, Mr. Monaghan, I, I don't want to disturb you. However, I got to get rid of Drummond Island. We're not making any money off of Drummond Island. And my employees have not had a bonus in six months. And I just think it's unfair. So either we're going to put a liquor license on it or you're going to sell it. But we're going to do something. We cannot just stay where we are. He says, we're losing money. Are we losing money? Oh my God. Mind you, I'm the HR director. So I whipped out the balance sheet to show all the places we're losing money. He was, how come the controller didn't tell me? I have no idea. But this island got to go. <laughs> he said, then sell it. I have never sold an island in my life. I'm an HR person. I said, okay, I'll tell them to sell it. He said, no, no, no. I want you to sell it. I went, why? He said, they didn't have excuse me, the balls to come in here and tell me that we're losing this much money. So since you did, and you took it upon yourself to say you need to save your employees, I want you to get rid of it as fast as you can. So I went back to my desk, said to my boss, I'm selling Drummond Island. He goes, I'll take care of it. No, 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 no. Mr. Monaghan said, I'm going to take care of it. I quickly gave the island to Sotheby's and they sold it. Would have never done that in a large company because it's totally out of my lane. But it gave me an opportunity to try something new which I did was to sell an island, which was exciting to get it whipped in shape and get it sold. But that would have never happened had I not had enough gall to look at my sheet and says, who revenue wise, we, we, we not doing well. And that's why as HR, you have to embrace the revenue numbers. You can't just look at your, your, your employee time to fill a time to hire numbers. You have to look at what is my employees impact on revenue and have those revenue conversations with your executives. And the minute you start doing it and start talking their language, they're going to look at you differently. They're going to respond to you differently. And you're going to get a much more um, readiness to move based on what you're going to say, because you know the employees. Wonderful. And we have just one more question. We still have some, some time. We still have about 10 okay. minutes, about five more minutes for you. Okay. And then we'll move on. So we just have one more question. 
And this question is, companies often direct employees to own their own career path and growth, but still may overlook those same employees, although they have increased their skills, knowledge, and such. Should the employee, especially if they are a BIPOC employee, ask for the promotion? And how do they do that, especially during this time of cutback, workforce reductions, and such? I have a long answer to that. How much time did you say we have? Actually, you, you probably have about six, seven minutes. So okay. You're good. <laughs> First of all, I just believe in sponsors, mentors, and advisors. I probably say it so much to my learners that I'm blue in the face because I believe every employee, not just executives, every employee in a corporation should have mentors, sponsors, and advisors. And I actually believe that should happen as they walk into the door. As HR, I don't think employees should own their own career development. One of the reasons why we're having this great resignation is because we have leaned on employees to have this career development when they have no clue how to man manipulate through their corporations. I personally believe that when we are doing performance appraisals or performance assessments, from the day they walk into a firm, we should identify where are they going and identify opportunities to hook them up with a mentor, a sponsor, and an advisor. The second thing that I, I, I believe is that corporations are not a meritocracy. Even though we want to say hard work gets you where you are, and women and BIPOC employees truly believe that, that is an untruth. Promotions come from being politically savvy. Yes, I said it, political savvy. But most of us believe that if we work hard, we're going to get promoted, and that is a piece of crock. It just doesn't happen. And I tell people, you have to learn to be politically savvy. So I just personally believe that HR has a responsibility to educate all of its employees at whatever level on how to find a sponsor, mentor, advisor internally and externally, and how to be politically savvy to be able to grow within their corporations and to define the career path the day they're hired. Because I believe that when you, a person starts at a job, we should know what their performance should look like at the end of the year to say that they were an excellent employee. That's a discussion we should have up front, what expectations we have. But I find a lot of companies don't do that. And that's the tragedy because we're losing talent who fit our culture, but because they didn't get their expectation, which is to grow, they leave. Employees who are growing and getting new assignments and getting paid more money, they never leave you. So the question I have to ask is, do you want to be on a recruiting wheel like a rat and kind of just going over and over again with the turnover? Or do you want to have a firm where people come in and they just keep going up the chain until they've exhausted and gotten to the C-suite? It's really up to you. But part of that to me has to be defined up front. And for BIPOC and women employees specifically, it is not defined up front. Number three, when it is defined, we have a tendency to put a BIPOC person with another BIPOC person or a woman with a, another woman as a mentor. The gender should not matter. The content should matter. If the person wants to go into data analytics, whether the employee is a male or female, blue, purple, or green does not matter. The point is that they have things they can teach that person and start to move them down their career path and give them advice on how to maneuver through the corporation in order to get to where they want to go. But I believe every person has some idea of a career that they want to do. They may not know 100%, but I believe that HR has a responsibility to put everybody on a career path. And if they decide to get off the career path, great. But no one should be in the same job for 10 straight years. First of all, they become dead weight. They are harmful to the culture. They become negative. 
and then they're there so long and at that point you can't get rid of them so my thing is you eliminate all of that you set people on a career path and you help them move forward if they can't move forward you help them on with an off ramp so that they can leave your corporation but that starts with the career path i just don't think that a lot of bipoc and women people are given career paths they're not defined and i think they should be defined even if they go off the, off the track. Um, and so I just believe that, that that to me is part of employee development, part of employee relations, and that should be standard to me in every performance appraisal. Now, when I say that, people go, oh, that's just so far, it's just we already got a lot of things to do. We don't wanna add that. Just put it in the performance appraisal. I know at every company I was at, I always changed the performance appraisal. And initially I would sit down and talk to the employee and say, where are you going? And know where they are. And I'm gonna tell you why that's important. I had a finance department um, for ADT here in Michigan, and I had a collection team, two commercial collectors and two residential collectors. And when I looked at my collection roster, I went, oh my God, 32% of my revenue is not being collected. That had to come stop because that means I'm borrowing money from the corporate headquarters and they're charging me an interest to borrow money. Oh, no, that's going to stop immediately. So when I went to go sit with the collectors to kind of get a sense of where they were coming from, Come to find out the commercial collectors hate com collecting commercial accounts. How they got to be commercial collectors, I do not know the history. But I said to the one commercial collector, I said, so what do you really want to do? She says, I really want to go into computer programming. Well, back then, everything was manual. I'm like, really? I couldn't find classes fast enough for her because <laughs> I wanted to automate this department anyway. I was like, how soon do you want to start? <laughs> she says, what do you mean? How soon do you want to start? I'm going to find you some classes because we're getting you out of commercial collection and in computer programming. And your first job is you're going, you're going to automate the payrolls, the, um, the procurement purchase order system to work yourself out of a job. She went great. Immediately got her into class. She created electronic purchase order system, worked herself out of a job, moved her out and put in a real collector who would go out there and get my money. It's a career development. So I just think that that should be part of the process across all corporations. Ida, thank you so much. This has been phenomenal. A lot of great information that was shared. You were very informative and I see some thank yous even in the chat. So thank you so much. Um, we hope to have you back sometime soon. Maybe we I would love to be back. Thank you for the opportunity to have this discussion. Absolutely. So um, to our audience, we want to thank you all for taking time out to be with us um, today. Again, thank you. Final reminder that the CE credit information will be sent to you within the next few days, up to a week. You can check your email. Also, there is a PowerPoint that will be shared. Um, with regard to the information that the speaker shared today. She will be sharing that PowerPoint with us um, as well. And then also, please, again, take time to complete the survey. We want to know how we're doing with MT Sherm and also would like to provide some feedback to our speaker. And then lastly, I will have to do just a small little plug. We do have several workshops and webinars that are always provided by MT Sherm. But the next one that will be sponsored by the DNI committee is on April the 6th at noon. And the topic is how to promote anti-racism and allyship in the workplace. Again, how to promote anti-racism and allyship in the workplace. Again, that will be on April the 6th. Please watch for um, that registration information. And again, we hope that you will continue to support MC Term with the webinars and information that we bring to you. So thanks everyone. And we hope that you will have a great rest of your afternoon and a great rest of your week. And thanks again, Ida. All right, see you guys. Thank okay. you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.